Hey everyone, Dr. Jack Gordy, and we've got a fun one for you this week. This video, we're covering macro parasites. Now, here's a macro parasite right here. This is a tapeworm that can live in your intestine. They can get really big. And um, doctors like to publish papers that sort of boast about the size of the tapeworm that they've found. They're all trying to outdo each other. Um, I just believe last week, a 50-footer was discovered in the Philippines, so they can get absolutely massive. Now, I love covering, covering uh, macro parasites, and I'll tell you why. There's a disease out there that, a disease out there that we call med student disease. And what it is, is when we teach medical students about diseases, sometimes they feel like those symptoms appear in them and they feel like they have that disease. Now this is called the nocebo effect. It's a little bit like the placebo effect, except instead of feeling good because you believe you have something, you feel bad because you believe you have you believe you've had something and in the case of diseases you might believe you have a disease and develop those symptoms now i don't think there's a human on the planet that doesn't get med student disease when you cover macro parasites when i start discussing scabies tunneling into your skin on your fingers or very large worms crawling out and laying eggs in your anus i am a hundred percent sure you won't you'll start to feel those creepy crawlies crawling on your skin and in your intestines so uh, it's a real fun one to, to cover and just try to try to mentally go okay i don't have scabies i'm just undergoing the nocebo effect that's a really good idea as i go through these next bunch of videos so let's jump into it macro means big now um how big is debated some people put malaria into the macro parasite category but malaria for most of its life is a single celled organism and so i wouldn't put it in there now the other the other question is maybe you think big must be multicellular well candida albicans the fungus is kind of multicellular it forms those pseudohyphae that grow like roots into your skin and so for me the definition of macro when it comes to macro parasite is it has to be big has to be multicellular has to be complex and what i mean by complex is we need multiple different kinds of cell types right we can't just have one or two different cell types we need epithelial cells muscle cells nerve cells we need multiple kinds of different cell types to be big and complex and multicellular and that to me is the definition of a macro parasite now, a parasite is just an organism that lives in or on another organism. And here's the key point, at their expense, right? Um, and this is where the disease aspect comes into it. If it costs us to have this organism inside of us, then it is a disease and it is a parasite. Now, there are some things that aren't, like there are good bacteria that live in our intestinal flora, and they provide us with vitamin K and they break down some compounds that we can't break down and we get to absorb some of those nutrients and they get a home to live and they get nutrients fed to them. And so this is a mutual, a mutualism, a mutually beneficial relationship and that is not a parasite. So you can't just live on or in the host. You also have to be at the detriment of that host to be counted as a parasite. Right, so there's lots of different kinds of macro parasites. Here we have an Ascaris worm. This is a round worm that lives in our intestines. Um, here we have scabies. This tunnels into our skin and eats our skin and lays its eggs and crawls around. And this is pubic lice. Um, and these are all examples of macro parasites. This is an endoscopy image. So this is a camera that's gone um, up the rectum there into the large intestine. Um, yeah, yeah, this is a large intestine, and, and on that camera they have spotted a large Ascaris worm, which is a very big round worm. So where do they sit, these macro parasites on the tree of life? Well, they're definitely in the eukaryote category. They're very complex, not only at the cellular level with nuclei and mitochondria, but at the multicellular le level. They've got muscles and nerves and all that jazz. They're actually animals right so they're the most evolutionarily close to humans as diseases get because they're animals we're kind of we're an animal they're an animal they're infecting us that's a tight evolutionary relationship
Um, they're communicable, they get spread throughout communities and in between individuals. They can be spread by contact, um, depending on the macro parasite, or we could shed them in some way, perhaps through our feces, and then it gets taken up and spread to other people. So they're communicable diseases. Are they a clade? Now, we've discussed this in previous videos. A clade is a branch in the tree of life that you could snip off and it would contain all the organisms of that clade. So what we can see here is there's nowhere to snip this tree of life um, and not include us, right? So we can't really break off a clade that is the macro parasites. They're actually, some of them look incredibly closely related like the tapeworm and the ascaris worm look very closely related but evolutionarily speaking they're incredibly distantly related so these two worms very distantly related on the evolutionary tree so they are definitely not a clade the macro parasites but what happens if we started to try to chunk up the macro parasites in groups? Can we find any clades in those groups? So the first way to break up macro parasites is an ectoparasite, which means on the outside, such as scabies eating our skin. That's an ectoparasite or a flea or a pubic lice. Those are ectoparasites. Then there's endoparasites. These are inside of us. Um, um, they're in our intestines or our lungs or even our brains. Um, and they are endoparasites. Okay, so can we break up the endoparasites? Well, the most common endoparasite is the helminths, right? Now, we call them helminths, and that means a worm that infects humans. That's all that it means, uh, but actually, these are not a clade, and they're very distantly related on the evolutionary tree. I mentioned that tapeworm and the roundworm, very distantly related on the evolutionary tree, but they're both endoparasites that we call helminths, and helminths means worms that infect humans humans uh, but worms even though they look the same can be evolutionarily very different the tapeworm is a flatworm for example ectoparasites um, again not necessarily a clade some people might class uh, leeches as an ectoparasite um, and they're not common they're not very tightly related to the scabies however the vast 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 majority of ectoparasites are arthropods are insects and in that respect they are a clade right so um, they are all part of a single clade that is the insects not all insects are um, not all insects are ectoparasites, but most ectoparasites are insects. And that has important medical ramifications because that means they're all evolutionarily very tightly related. And so therefore, selective toxicity, that is a drug that can target all those ectoparasites is actually much easier to create than in the case of other organisms um, that are more disparately related. Um, so, for example, there are insecticide creams that kill all insects, and, and it's a cream that can apply to the skin, so or the hair, or the um, or the uh, pubic hair, and so that could kill head lice, pubic lice, and scabies, all with this one drug. And that's because most ectoparasites do belong to the clade that is insects or arthropoda. So where does it sit on the global death scale? So we've got E. coli and influenza and malaria, staphylococcus and fungal infections and COVID-19, which is off the charts right there. So where does macroparasites sit? So it's really hard to come up with a number, but around 500,000 is a reasonable estimate. Um, and these would be the macroparasites. But I've got to tell you that the error bars on this are huge. And it really depends on how you count it. Now, why is that? Well, it's very rare for a macro parasite to directly kill you, right? That does happen in some rare occasions, and I'm going to cover that on a later video. But for the most part, what they do is they degrade your health a little bit, and they are part of your diseased burden. Now, what that means is they might be the straw that breaks the camel's back. If you are malnourished, immune suppressed, you're vitamin deficient, and now you've got a huge load of helminths in your intestine, that could be the straw that breaks the camel's back and leads to your death. Now, the, the question is, is does it then get attributed to you, as, to the disease, to the macro parasite as a death? Does it get recorded as a death um, on a global scale? And you can see how hard it is to start to count these up. 
So um, take that number with a grain of salt, 500,000. The critical thing is, is it does have a huge burden on human society whether or not it is causing a huge amount of death. And let me explain why. Now, this I'm going to turn into a pie chart. This is the Earth. Um, let's turn this into a pie chart. What percentage of human beings have a macro parasite? Well, this number again is hard to count because you can't just add up all the people with roundworm and all the people with tapeworm and all the people with scabies because many of those people overlap and actually have multiple parasites. Um, <clears throat> but it's roughly speaking well over half in fact there is one parasite called toxoplasmogondii that at a certain dormant life stage sits in your brain and it's estimated that maybe as high as 50 percent of the world has that parasite so that parasite alone gets us close to half the population then you start adding in roundworm which is roughly one in six people and and um other worms that are um 800 000, eight, um, sorry 800 million people uh 500 million people scabies uh, pubic pubic lights it really really adds up to so i really think there's probably an underestimate and or each of this is coming at a cost maybe not a huge cost but at a cost to the host and that's why they're called parasites now are they obligate or opportunistic pathogens these are another box that we like to put all our diseases in they are obligate yes right so um, because they live on or in us um, they are considered uh, um, they are obligate now let me give you an example so vampire bats drink our blood but we don't consider them a macro parasite we more consider them a predator because they don't live on or in us they just come for a snack so um, by definition to be considered a parasite you live on or in that organism that makes you obligate right you have to be there but the real question is is do you have to be a pathogen or a parasite if you're a macro parasite the answer is yes ish maybe it's complicated and this is really interesting if you'd said 15 years ago um, are macro parasites a disease everyone would have said yes and everyone would have said they're a parasite they're a burden to the human being but now there's more and more research coming out that there are some benefits in the to having one of these macro parasites particularly intestinal worms so the question is do the benefits outweigh the costs and that's a really hard question to answer and i'm going to delve into that a bit deeper later but in general i think we would say they are a pathogen and a parasite and it's better to get rid of them and we need a bit more research before we can start talking them talking to them talking about them as if they're a beneficial thing to have yeah so it's kind of funny these macro parasites might actually not need a name change soon uh, because some of them might be symbiotic organisms uh, and there might be uh, mutualistically beneficial relationships between some of these worms if you have a low dose and i'm going to jump into that a bit more in later videos in fact up next we're going to cover the helminth worm the most common one and it's called ascaris that's a genus that covers multiple species